Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in for Breakpoint. Before hey. we get on to the actual episode, just wanted to make sure that you know and to take advantage of, if you scroll a little bit further down on the page, it's this little form that says, uh, that gets you to fill out your information. And basically what that's gonna do is get someone from our team to contact you guys on how to be the Visual Studio champion in your organization. Pretty so, cool. Yeah, super quick form, just five, five or so fields. Submit that and uh, we'll get in touch with you. Um, that's about it. So see you on the show shortly. Go champs. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the December 2014 episode of Breakpoint. Um, my name is Paul Laverish. Uh, if you've watched for previous versions of Breakpoint, uh, you'll, you'll know who I am. If not, welcome. Uh, it's good to have you aboard. Uh, you may notice that um, I'm kind of alone here today. Uh, my uh, partner in crime, Jonathan, is, uh, isn't here today, but uh, he'll be uh, back for the next episode of Breakpoint. Uh, so because we, we miss him here, uh, we've actually added him in spirit uh, as, a, uh, as a paper token of himself, as you can see right there. Uh, he's, uh, he's right there. It's a newer, silent, more silent version of JR, uh, as we like to call him. So, uh, so welcome, JR. Yeah, he doesn't have anything to say. What can I tell you? So, uh, anyways, uh, I'm going to be uh, hosting you for the next uh, few, um, you know, 45 minutes uh, to an hour or so, and we're going to talk about. Um, uh, well, basically, we're going to talk about mobile applications, cross-platform ma mobile applications as they relate to hybrid applications. So, just let me uh, uh, set up my uh, slides here. And uh, when we talk about mobile applications, I. I spent a lot of my time uh, in the past and certainly also in the present talking to developers around mobile application strategies. And it's really interesting to see how, how developers sort of view their, uh, their way of going into the, uh, into the mobile space if they've not done so before or what they're, what they're thinking of doing. And, and it, what I find really interesting is that there's two camps, right? You have one camp that says native is best. You should always build a native application. Uh, that way you can make full use of your, uh, you know, the, the stack on the mobile device and the operating system and all that kind of thing. Then you have another set of uh, people in a different camp that basically say that, you know, well, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying around native applications and the power that they bring, but there's some flexibility with creating a web application or even a hybrid application that combines a little bit of native and a little bit of, of, of web. And to be honest, um, both strategies, if you will, are, are, are equally relevant and equally um, um, correct. It really depends on a number of different things that, uh, uh, that are sort of external to what you're, you're, you're thinking of when you actually build your mobile applications. One is, you know, like if you're familiar with the platform that you're building for and the languages associated with it. So say, for example, you're building for iOS. Well, you kind of have to know Objective-C or Swift if you're doing it natively on that machine, on, on, on that platform. Or maybe you know C-sharp. And uh, there's some facilities within Visual Studio uh, with a partner called Xamarin. And we talked about Xamarin in the previous episode, so I'm not going to get too much into that, um, where you can actually build a native mobile application uh, for iOS, for Android, for Windows, Windows Phone, uh, among others uh, coming up, that allow you to uh, really build a native native experience uh, across those different platforms and share that code. But not everybody knows C-sharp, for example, or not everybody wants to build a mobile application. If you're a web developer, um, why wouldn't you want to use the, uh, the capabilities of your web skills, your web development skills, to build applications for the mobile space? So, um, but those are the two different camps. And like I said, they're, they're equally relevant. Um, there's no one right answer, and, and it really depends a lot on your skill set and what you want to do. Um, there's also benefits and drawbacks to each side as well. So if you're building a native application, um, you know, you do typically, if you're doing a consumer-based application more often than not, uh, you're probably pushing that application to a store, whether that's the Apple App Store, Google Play, or the Windows Store, for example, to actually de uh, deliver your applications. Um, and that requires you to do updates and you have to do that certification process and all those types of things, which is both good and bad in some ways, right? So A, it protects the consumer because it allows them to make sure that they're, um, you know, there's no malicious code and all those types of things typically. 
And it also makes sure that your application is rock solid. It, it provides and it requires you to have a set of structure around how you deliver your applications. And on the website, um, the great news is, is if you do have an update to the actual logic of your application, it's a website. Um, maybe it's localized on, on, on the mobile device itself, but in some cases, a lot of people actually host it as a separate website on their own. You know, that's not a bad way of doing things as well, because it means that you don't have to go to the store to do an update necessarily all the time. If you're making changes to the style or to the content and all those types of things, or to the structure and navigation of your project, well, it's a website, which means that if it's hosted on the web, then you can make use of that and, and, and go from there. So it's actually quite easy to do that way. But at the same time, both have their drawbacks, right? So again, we talked about the fact that you have to update your applications and things like that from a native standpoint. It does require you to pay very special attention to each mobile platform that you're supporting. Um, while as on the web side, if you're building a hybrid application, for example, um, you do have to worry about you know, the look and feel of your application. Um, if you build a single web application, maybe you make it look like an iOS app, that's not going to look very good on a, on a Windows phone or an Android phone, for example. So you have to pay special close attention to the design and the experiential components of your application on the web as well. So it's, you know, it's a bit of a balancing act. You have to figure out exactly what's most important to you as a developer and what you think is going to be clicking the most with your end users uh, as to how you sort of uh, deliver that application. So once you figure that out, um, I, th I think it's, it's probably fairly, fairly obvious in most developers' minds which way they're going to go, whether they're going to build a web app or whether they're going to build a native app. And today what we're going to talk about is a uh, technology called Cordova. Um, and we'll get a little bit into what that is in a second, but um, the idea behind Cordova is that it's a hybrid application. So it's got a little bit of native and it's got a little bit of web, right? So that's, that's kind of interesting because it allows you to uh, really sort of leverage a whole bunch of different things together. One, as a web developer potentially, you have a lot of skill sets within, you know, using JavaScript and CSS and HTML and maybe the latest HTML5 standards. Make use of that in your mobile applications. You're good to go. Um, you also have access to a lot of the facilities that are available natively to the device because basically you're going to have access to things such as you know, the, uh, uh, the GPS device or maybe the accelerometer and all those types of things as well. Because basically what happens with something like uh, Cordova is you have a native wrapper. So if you think about it, it's, it's a shell application that sort of sits on your mobile, application, uh, mobile device that is basically native code that has a window into a browser-based application. So it's basically the browser-based application hosted within, within the native uh, shell. <coughs> and that's basically how that works. Now, as far as um, uh, the way it works is uh, Cordova has an interesting history. So those of you that have been in the mobile space for a while may have known um, that um, there used to be a technology called PhoneGap. And PhoneGap was exactly what I just described, right? So a native shell surrounding a web application. And that's all well and good. Um, and uh, it's interesting because it's actually uh, was built by a couple Canadians, if I understand correctly. Uh, so if you're Canadian watching this, there's some pride there as well. You know, a great Canadian sort of uh, um, uh, uh, product, if you will. And it was bought by Adobe. So Adobe, very, very rich. Uh, software company uh, from a rich from a well, from a revenue standpoint, but I was thinking more from a uh, design standpoint and the software uh, product standpoint. They have great software. They have provided some 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 extra boost, I guess you could say, to the to the PhoneGap team. And what they did was they actually open sourced PhoneGap and put it under the Apache license. So now it's actually uh, when you think about PhoneGap, you're actually more thinking about um, Apache Cordova, as it's called there, and you can see the logo in the little blue box there. And frankly, I think their logo is actually pretty cool. It kind of reminds me of of Eva from uh, the movie Wall-E, except this one's a little bit more square rather than Eva. That that was a little bit more round, which is interesting. But uh, but the bottom line here is that you know you can build applications that are cross-platform with Cordova, so you can support iOS, you can support uh, Android, you can support Windows. You can support you know, all different types of devices and things like that, which is very, very interesting to you if you're looking to actually build your applications and provide that wide swath or wide area uh, of support for all your various different user bases, regardless of the device that they're on. And the good news is, is if you're familiar with Visual Studio, 
uh, and you, you use it on a daily basis, for example, you can use uh, Visual Studio to build Cordova-based applications, among other different applications, obviously, but, but we're specifically focusing on Cordova here today. Just recently, um, over the past six months or so, uh, we've released a, a number of different tools uh, that allow you to build hybrid applications, um, actually over the past few couple years, actually, to build hybrid applications on, on Visual Studio. But typically, in the past, some of those tools were really focused on the Windows platform. So yes, you could build a, a hybrid application, but it really only worked on Windows Phone, or it only worked on Windows Store applications. Well, we partner with the Cordova uh, team to actually deliver Cordova tooling to Visual Studio as part of, uh, uh, part of the, the value add that you have for that. So that, that's, that's great news. So basically means that you know, um, Visual Studio is an extremely powerful uh, HTML5 editor. Uh, if you've not used it for HTML5 development or web development in the past and you're interested, I do suggest you take a look at it. Um, I'll be doing basically all my demos and things like that using Visual Studio and things like that as well. Um, it's, it's very powerful. There's lots of facilities in there for web developers to be very productive. And, and we've really thought through the workflow, uh, which, is, which is interesting as well, right? The workflow for web developers and how that sort of goes. And it also, as you, if you're familiar with Visual Studio, it really does have a lot of connectivity into all sorts of diff different other services as well. So that end-to-end -end spectrum of connectivity to services that developers will use and things like that, alongside the powerful editing tools within Visual Studio for web development, it actually provides you with a very, very strong story for actually developing great applications uh, for Cordova. Uh, and we'll get in a little bit to that as well. So, Let's talk a little bit about what Cordova is. And I sort of went through this already, right? So it's, uh, it's, a, it's an open source framework. And it was actually uh, delivered uh, from the phone, back, phone gap team, which was then bought by Adobe. So you can download it. Uh, you can take a look at it. Um, there's lots of documentation on it. There's lots of applications out there. In fact, I think there's a stat that says when there was a, um, there was a, uh, a study done that basically said that over all the application stores that are out there today, Almost 6% of the applications are actually using Cordova uh, or PhoneGap or some sort of uh, you know, PhoneGap-like or Cordova-like uh, uh, capability uh, to deliver those applications. Now, 6% doesn't seem like a lot from a percentage standpoint, but it's actually a significant number of applications. And it's growing, which is interesting as well, right? So you can deliver a great user experience using web-based applications in a hybrid format on mobile devices that co covers all sorts of different mobile devices as well. So that's a good news story right there, right? As I mentioned before, um, the way it works is that it's actually hosted within a native wrapper, as I said before, a shell, if you will. So the native code that actually integrates and, and talks to the various different facilities within the mobile operating system. So ability to access GPS, like I said, or accelerometer or gyroscope or you know, helper sort of tasks such as, you know, setting up a phone call or, you know, uh, creating an email or, or talking to other applications on the actual device itself. And then the actual application, the, 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 the real brains of your application is basically your website. It's, uh, it's the JavaScript and the CSS and the HTML5 that you're actually doing. So your typical web application. And the good news about that is that if you've built your web application properly, you can target multiple different devices. Uh, which is obviously very, very good as well uh, because that means that you have full support for, you know, a wide different variety of devices. And, you know, from if you're worried about, you know, the ability to manage, you know, scalability of various different sort of screen size and things like that, if that's something that's of worry to you, um, it's probably less of a worry to you in a lot of ways if you're using web-based applications because you can use familiar tools that you already have today, such as media queries, to manage the size of your screen and the interactivity components to it as well. So you can really define what the user experience would be, say, for example, on a very small device, such as you know, Windows Phone uh, 500 series, for example, uh, which has a very small screen size, to something very, very large, such as you know, a, uh, a Nokia Lumia uh, 1520 or a Samsung Note 4 or whatever it is that you might have, like the phablets, right? And it's the same code base beyond, uh, across all those different types of things uh, because it does provide you all that. And the Cordova plugin API uh, basically allows you to use JavaScript within your web application to talk to the native wrapper, which then marshals those calls to the various different operating system components that you need. 
right? So it's a way to sort of provide you with the ability to have a conduit of communication between your JavaScript within your web application and actually talk to the mobile, uh, mobile operating system itself as well. So again, say for example, you were creating a, uh, a game and uh, your game was basically a JavaScript HTML5 game, uh, but you needed accelerometer support to really make it work, right? So maybe it's a racing game or something like that. Well, you could you do that by just uh, adding calls within your JavaScript that actually talk to the Cordova API set to actually access the native uh, wrapper to make calls to the, um, uh, to the accelerometer or the gyroscope or things like that, for example. So lots of great, uh, great capabilities there. Very rich, very, very possible for you to make uh, amazing cross-platform applications that way. And as I said before, from a statistic standpoint, around 6% of the apps in, in the stores across are, are basically um, you know, Cordova-based or, or hybrid-based. And it's actually, as you can see right there, a little bit larger even in the enterprise. Um, and that is probably not very surprising that it's double what you see in the consumer space because of the fact that enterprises in general have made a lot of investments in web-based technologies like intranet applications and things like that. So why wouldn't they leverage that uh, the assets that they've already created and the hard work that they've actually done before in a mobile application and sort of retrofit the screens and things like that to make it fit properly within a mobile sort of context but ultimately, the, uh, the logic and things like that remain the same. So that's a, that's a good news story right there, and I think that's, uh, that's something very, very uh, useful. So how does Visual Studio fit into this? Well, like I said before, we partnered with the Apache Cordova team to deliver great richness uh, of you know, tooling uh, that is available within Visual Studio so that you can use those, those tools to build great Cordova-based applications as well. Um, so as you can see right there, you know, you, you, we, we do provide you with a lot of facilities to, to build applications and things like that, which is really interesting. So I guess the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to get out of uh, PowerPoint right now, and I'm actually going to show you where you can find Cordova, because I think that's the first step that's actually very, very interesting. So I'm going to go to a virtual machine, okay? Um, and this is an Azure virtual machine, and we'll explain a little bit why I'm using virtual machines in a second. Uh, but you can see this is just Windows 8.1 uh, that I'm running right here. It sort of, you might be able to see it here in the background. And it's actually got Visual Studio installed on it already. So this is basically Visual Studio 2013. Uh, and if I click on Internet Explorer or your browser of choice, um, obviously Internet Explorer is the one that I choose to use most often, I can just do a search and say Visual Studio, Studio Cordova. You know, just those three, three uh, uh, words. And as you can see here, what shows up is just a, a number of different listings here. And what you see here is we have some, uh, a landing page for Visual Studio for Apache Cordova. So the good news here is that we provide you with a lot of guidance right from the get-go before you even install the tools if that's what you want. So you know we have an overview. So we provide you with an overview from, uh, from Ryan Salva, who's a, a principal program manager lead on the team for the Cordova tooling within Visual Studio. Uh, and provides you with some, some, some overview content to get you familiar with some of this stuff. So if you want to take a look at that, you can. Gives you the typical things that you would find on the product page, right? So all these types of things are, you know, you can see debug and analyze and all that kind of stuff. But it also tells you, you know, how you actually get the stuff. So you can see there's a quick start. Um, and I can actually just go to Visual Studio Tools for Apache Cordova, CTP3. So basically, this is a community technology preview, uh, which is basically means that it's not currently in production, uh, but it is available to you to make use of. It's fully free. Uh, it's an add-on to Visual Studio 2013. In the next version of Visual Studio, Visual Studio 2015, it'll actually be built in, uh, as I understand it. So there's that. Uh, you do need update for Visual Studio 2013 to make use of these tooling, this tooling, um, and you do need to, uh, Visual Studio 2013. It doesn't work with 2012, uh, at least as far as I understand it. So just uh, be aware of those types of things. So if I click on this, and as you can see here, it's going to ask you to download it. And then if I click on this part here, <coughs> it's going to ask me, do I want to uh, download it? I've already previously downloaded it. So that's why it's uh, so quick here. And I'm going to click on Run. And it's going to bring up the, uh, the installer uh, because I already have Visual Studio installed. So you can see here, it says setup requires up to 6 gigabytes across all drives. It's fairly large, right? Um, but uh, there's a reason for that. So I'm going to click on I agree to the licensing terms, as always, which you should probably read the licensing terms and privacy policy. You know, 
always read what you're, you're doing. There's nothing malicious in what we're doing, but just make sure that you know what you're getting into and stuff like that. I always, uh, regardless of what piece of software that you're installing, it's, it's a good thing to do that. And as you can see here, um, then when I click Next, it actually says, okay, well, there's, we're going to install the tools for Visual Studio for you already here. And that's all well and good, but there's a number of other third parties tools that are important that we need to install as well. So if you've ever done Cordova work before and things like that, to get that cross-platform sort of um, uh, capabilities requires a lot of different sort of um, um, uh, software. So as you can see here, you require Node.js, uh, Apache Ant, the JDK, so the Java Development Kit for Android, for example, the Android SDK, Google Chrome, and we'll explain why that in a bit. Uh, a Git command line, so if you want to do things like that. SQLite for Windows, and uh, even Apple iTunes, which is kind of interesting too, right? Again, this is because it requires that from a, an iOS standpoint to actually deliver and, 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 and create uh, the proper tooling for, uh, for debugging iOS applications and things like that. Plus, also things like WebSocket and things. So there's a lot of different pieces of software that are required to actually get Apache Cordova working properly. So we do that for you. All, the, uh, all, all, all through it. So you can actually direct download each of these things. We provided your link. Also, the licensing terms with each of these things. So again, you know, read the licensing terms because you just want to make sure that you understand what you're doing. You click install. I'm not going to bother doing that because watching uh, uh, software install is like watching paint dry. We don't want to do that. Right, JR? Still not talking. All right. All right. So anyways, uh, I'm just going to exit that, but that's basically what you do. So if you have Visual Studio 2013 Update 4, um, all, the, all the SKUs that are available, everything from Community uh, all the way through to Ultimate. I use Ultimate uh, because of all the various different other tooling that is available. Uh, you can do that, and then it will install it all for you. Once it's all done, you're ready to go, and we'll show you what that looks like. So very, very simple. Uh, and in fact, what I'll do now is I'm just going to cancel the setup, and I'll exit this virtual machine that I have in the cloud. Um, the last thing that, that I'm going to talk about, and we'll get into actually showing you some demos in a little bit here, uh, is uh, the fact that you know Visual Studio, um, it's an integrated development environment, right? IDE, um, and everything that is good about Visual Studio, everything that is, you know, rich and featureful, and and provides you with the great tooling that allow you to be productive as a developer, as a designer, as a team member, um, that's all available to you as part of. Uh, as part of a, a Cordova application, which is kind of cool, right? So the ability to do, you know, integrate tests to your application lifecycle management uh, and, you know, check in, check out, and things like that to TFS or whatever sort of uh, repository that you have, plus debugging facilities, including things such as, you know, the ability to have, uh, you know, IntelliTrace on the server and things like that if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, do load testing, for example, on your applications if you want to do that as well. Because these are web applications that are more probably more typically found in, in the web rather than localized within your device, you know, load testing is something that's very, very interesting. So if you, if you want to do that, you can do that with Visual Studio Ultimate. And it also provides you with things such as you know, uh, IntelliSense, so the ability to have full IntelliSense on JavaScript and, and CSS and things like that too. So that's all, always uh, very, very good. So I'm actually going to exit the uh, slides because that's all the slides that I have. And we're going to get right into demo now, uh, just to show you some of this stuff. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do something that's probably going to throw you a bit for a loop, is I'm going to start in Microsoft Azure. Um, so Microsoft Azure, if you're not familiar with it, is our cloud platform. And the reason why I'm doing this is because there's a number of different bonus features, if you will, if you have an MSDN subscription. So MSDN, if you're not familiar with it, is a Microsoft Developer Network subscription. Uh, it comes with paid SKUs of Visual Studio, so Visual Studio Pro, uh, Test Pro, Premium, and Ultimate. And basically what you get with that is that you have benefits that allow you to use, uh, for non-production use, uh, Microsoft Azure, which is our cloud platform. So you get credits every month uh, that you can use towards building applications in the cloud, uh, which include a number of different things. So. You can create, uh, as you can see here, mobile services, which are basically building blocks for building applications, uh, mobile applications, everything from database uh, connectivity, API sets, access control lists, even push notification services. 
which are obviously something that's very, very common across you know, very rich uh, mobile applications. And you can make use of those in your, in your Cordova applications as well. Won't go too deeply into that. Uh, there's lots of content on mobile services out there already today, uh, but I did want to mention that. But the reason why I'm doing this is because you may notice that all my demos I'm actually doing in virtual machines. And the reason why I want to do that is if you have an MSDN subscription, you can actually create a virtual machine with Visual Studio already installed on it with the Cordova tooling built in as well. So you don't have to go and actually install Visual Studio on your own desktop or you know, uh, download the uh, Apache tooling if you don't want to. You can actually do that here. So it's very easy to actually create a virtual machine. I'll do that very quickly. So you can see here, if I go to the New button here at the bottom, and I go from Gallery, you'll see that there's a number of different images that are available to me as uh, you know, in my Azure side. And I'm going to specifically focus on the Visual Studio side. So you can see here in Visual Studio, if I click on that, there's a whole bunch of different images examples that we have here. So you can see here, I can create a TFS instance, which is our, basically our work item tracking and version control uh, product. Um, you also have access to basically a lot of different sort of versions of Visual Studio um, up to the subscription level that you have. So if I have a premium, uh, Visual Studio uh, Premium plus MSDN, I can get Visual Studio Professional, Visual Studio Premium, uh, but I don't get Ultimate, for example. But I have an Ultimate subscription, so I get all the, these things. But you can see here, for example, we have a number of different, uh, different things here. So we have Visual Studio Premium Update 3 with tools for Apache Cordova 2.0, for example. So, so these are already all, all, all created for you. So we have this for Professional, we have it for Premium, and we have it for, uh, for Ultimate, uh, depending on the level of subscription that you have with the Cordova tooling already in. So if you don't want to install the Cordova tooling on your machine and you do have access to an MSDN subscription, this is a good way to start and test it out and try it out and things like that. So I would, uh, I would suggest you do that. In fact, I'm going to spend most of my demo time, in fact, not all of it, within a virtual machine that I already created. So I'm going to go to that virtual machine right now. And the way I've set this up is I have an Ultimate, a Visual Studio Ultimate 2013 uh, uh, set up here with, with Cordova already installed on it as well. So as you can see here, I've already started Visual Studio just uh, so that we don't have to wait for it. And it's actually quite easy to start up a Visual Studio application. Now, uh, or a, uh, a Cordova application project. So I, all I got to do is go to File, New Project, like you always do within Visual Studio. And as you can see here, there's, and I can't really zoom in very well in my virtual machine, so I apologize. There's two different things here. I'm going to focus on my demos on the, uh, the JavaScript side. So the reason why it's in JavaScript is because obviously a Cordova application is primarily a web-based application, which is a JavaScript-based application, right? So you see here there's store apps, which is basically creating applications that use WinJS, which is the Windows JavaScript library for uh, native applications running JavaScript. Uh, but that's out of, uh, out of scope for what we're doing because we're building hybrid applications that work, live on the web as well. Uh, or maybe local on your machine, uh, on your device, but, but it's still a web-based application. And we have here a multi-device hybrid application. As you can see here, blank app, Apache Cordova. And you also see here, it install the tools for Apache Cordova. But I've already done that, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> now, there's another way you can do this, and this is under TypeScript. Now, if you're not familiar with TypeScript, TypeScript is basically just a... Um, it's an implementation of JavaScript that Microsoft has provided. It's fully compliant, 100% compliant with JavaScript and the ECMAScript uh, um, uh, standards. So there's nothing different about TypeScript to JavaScript because TypeScript is JavaScript. There's no add-ons, extensions, plugins, whatever. What it did, what it does though, is it provides you with some things that are really nice from a programming standpoint, such as you know type safety. Because if you're ever, if you've done JavaScript development before, you may notice that you know. When you create a variable, um, that variable can contain almost anything. It can contain characters, it can contain a string, an array of numbers, a, a float, a, you know, a decimal, an integer, whatever. And if your variable contains the wrong types of values, say, for example, you're trying to uh, you know, uh, do a, um, an addition, for example, a function that does addition, and you're adding in, you know, uh, a variable that has like a, a string of characters, it's, it's going to fail on you and it's going to have a runtime error. Um, this TypeScript capability uh, is basically something that will uh, uh, help you avoid those types of things. So it provides that type safety so that it finds out right away before you even deliver your application 
where there might be issues and things like that. So if you're interested, just go to typescript.org uh, and find out more about that. But like I said, we're going to stay away from that. Uh, we're just going to focus on standard uh, JavaScript and things like that. So we're going to stay within the multi-device hybrid application within JavaScript. So we'll create a blank application. We'll call this blank Cordova app 2. That's fine. We'll use the uh, defaults that are, that are there. It doesn't really matter. And it's going to create the, um, the project structure. So what you see here is basically the project uh, that you see here. And as you might imagine, there's a whole bunch of different things that are here. So your CSS is basically where you actually keep your cascading style sheets, right? So this is the way your application can look and feel and things like that uh, from that standpoint. So this is where you would make sure that you know it has the right look and feel for iOS versus Android versus Windows Phone versus Blackberry, whatever it is that you're actually doing. There's also some standard stuff. So you see here, for example, in index.html. We'll get into that in a little bit. It's just standard HTML. There's nothing wild about it, OK? And here in the res side, you'll see, for example, we have different screens. Now, the screens are basically for things that are specific to the platform that you're de developing for. So if I take a look at Android, for example, there's a whole bunch of different sort of screen landscapes. So it provides you with some defaults here uh, so that it allows you to find out, for example, the um, uh, the sizes of the screens and things like that. So anything that would be specific to the platform. Uh, so if something was different about Android compared to iOS that you're actually building your application for, it would go in the res uh, sort of set of um, um, uh, folders, which is basically your resources and things like that too. So those are specific to, uh, to those. But as you can see here, we also have scripts. And your scripts are basically your JavaScript. So we have an index.js plus a platform override. And the platform override is basically the area, and I'll just go very quickly. There shouldn't be too much in here. In fact, there's nothing. Basically, what this platform override.js file is for is for code that spe is specific to each platform, right? So there's a set of standard APIs that are you know, set up so that you, know, you have cross-platform capabilities across all the different platforms that you're supporting. But maybe there's a situation where it's, there's a different functionality for iOS compared to Windows Phone that you're trying to do. Well, you would actually put that functionality within your override uh, J JavaScript fold, uh, uh, um, file so that it can actually figure out exactly, okay, well, because we're in Windows Phone, we're going to do something different here, for example. Okay. Um, but we're just going to keep it very, very simple because uh, this will be a, pretty much just a glorified uh, Hello World app, but maybe a little bit more exciting. If I actually take a look here at the index.html, like you see here, it's just a standard you know, HTML5 document. It's got the meta information around the char character sets, the title, you know, all these types of things. So we're going to name this, and we're going to call this um, Exploding Dinosaurs, just for the heck of it. OK. And here we'll basically say, OK, so that's the title of it. And here we're going to say, hello, your application is ready. We'll change this. We'll make this a little bit, uh, we'll say Exploding Dinosaurs. and put an exclamation mark because it's exciting. And here we're going to add something. So I'm going to add an image to my application. So as you can see here, there's images. If I click on this and uh, oh, try to dra drag it by mistake. So I'm just going to right click on this and add an existing item, which is going to be an image. Okay. Now if I go to the desktop, I just happen to have this image available to me here. and so let me find it. There it is. OK. So now this image is there. And as, as you can see from Visual Studio standpoint, as I hover over it, you can actually see the image and all that kind of stuff too. So uh, it's basically a dinosaur riding a motorcycle with an explosion in the background, if you can't really see it. So basically what we're going to do now is now that we have that, I'm actually going to add that image in. OK. So we'll put the image tag in here. As you can see, image source, source equals. And I'll say images and DE. So you can see here there's some IntelliSense, which actually helps me with my project as well. So if I type something in wrong, uh, it'll give me an error. This way, it automatically has it properly. And we'll basically say, and we'll finish that here like that. Now, there's some other things that I can do. Because this is just HTML, I can do all sorts of cool things as well. So one of the things that I've added as part of uh, uh, part of my install is after the fact, after I created this virtual machine, I added something called Visual Studio Web Essentials. So if I go to here and I say, for example, I go to, uh, if I do a search for VS, or if I go to vswebessentials.com, 
This is basically an add-on to Visual Studio that contains a lot of forward-looking sort of web facilities and functionality for Visual Studio that allows you to do some great things, right? So as you can see here, uh, you can download it. It's completely free. And it provides you with a whole bunch of different things from, you know, if you know, right for JavaScript, TypeScript, CoffeeScript, less, whatever, plus all sorts of things like facilities for um, uh, IntelliSense across a whole bunch of different things. The most recent versions of standards, because standards actually change over time as well, we will add those into Visual Studio Web Essentials so that you can actually manage those things. I'm not going to go very deep into what Web Essentials is. Um, you can actually do a search for VS Web Essentials and find some great resources on what's in it and things like that. So I do suggest you take a look at that. You can even take a look at vswebessentials.com, which is what I'm on right now, to find out some more great uh, features of that. But I've already downloaded it. But there's one feature that I thought was actually kind of cool, and I, I like to show it off. So we're actually going to do something here, and it's, it's basically uh, called what we call SimCode. And if I do uh, basically this, if I go to section div, uh, and then if I say, for example, li uh, times 5, and then lorem 3. So basically what this is, is basically this is, if I wanted to create a section tag, uh, and then a div tag inside of the section, and then set up a list of five items with lorem ipsum of the first three letters of lorem ipsum in each of those things, I could actually do that. So once I've actually done that, this doesn't actually show it here, but what I, if I do a, a tab now, it's actually going to create it. So as you can see here, it created all this uh, code for me automatically. So that's all well and good, and you can see here it's where I got all the, the information here, so that's kind of cool, right? So that's, that's, that's nice. So I can even do things such as if I, if I wanted to move this specific uh, item down, uh, so I keep on hovering over that image, so I apologize. So if I, if I want to move this item down, all I have to do is pr press on the Alt key and actually move these things around. So you can see here, up and down with the Alt key, I can actually move a full line of code or a full line of uh, hypertext across as well. So it's just some, some great little things that are available to me that I can actually do. Now that's not specific to Cordova, that's just web development. But that's kind of cool, you know, just to, the, the fact that you can do all these types of things. Now, because this is also a, um, uh, this is actually a, a web page, you can actually make use of any JavaScript library that's out there today. Uh, so, for example, you can see here, obviously, as you might imagine, there's a Cordova.js uh, library that's included because, obviously, this is a Cordova application. Uh, plus, you know, custom scripts that you create within your project as well. But say, for example, I wanted to add jQuery or Angular or Bootstrap or, you know, whatever sort of client library that you want uh, for, for your JavaScript side things, you can add those in and make use of those within your Cordova applications as well. Uh, so that's great and all that. Okay, so now that we've done that, that's all well and good, but we don't really have, um, we, we, we don't see this yet. So how do we actually do some debugging on these things? Well, within Visual Studio, you can see here, I'm currently on Android, but I can actually change this to iOS, Windows Phone, Windows under various different sort of CPU types, such as ARM-based processor, 64-bit, uh, 32-bit, uh, and all those types of things, so that you can actually do these uh, things and actually uh, debug and, and, and all that kind of stuff within, within the device type that you are actually looking for. Now, one caveat is that iOS debugging is coming. It's not currently available, uh, but that by the time it goes live out, out of CTP, uh, the intent is that uh, iOS will have debugging facilities as well, but you will need a Mac for that, uh, as I understand it. So, so just be aware of that, uh, and that's just a limitation based on iOS and how Apple sort of architected their platform and such. And it's their prerogative; they can do whatever they want with their 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 platform. I'll just stay on Android just for the heck of it. And the way you debug these things is you actually just uh, there's a debugger fit facility here, and you can see that there's all sorts of different sort of uh, op options that I have here. So I can use the device. So if I have an Android device that I want to hook up to it, so I just plug it into my uh, PC, and then I can actually do, uh, do device testing and things like that as well. I can use the Android emulator, which is um, it's good, but sometimes a little bit slow depending on things. We're actually going to be providing an Android emulator of our own within Visual Studio uh, in the next version of Visual Studio, Visual Studio 2015, which is actually quite fast. So uh, stay tuned for that uh, and, and that. But you can also see something called Ripple. Now, Ripple provides you with a number of different, uh, excuse me, just a little stuffed up here. It provides you with a, a, a number of different sort of uh, options here for, you know, 
uh, debugging through through Chrome, the Chrome browser, which I'm going to show you. And it provides you with the, the, the reference devices. So you can see the Nexus 7, Nexus S, and Nexus Galaxy, which we have here. And I'm just going to stay on the Nexus Galaxy, and I'm going to click on Debug. And uh, that's fine. I'm not sure why that happened. Let's try that again. Of course, not sure what's going on here. So we'll save it. Maybe that's a problem. No, of course not. OK. Um, Let's exit the file, and then we'll start it again, OK? So we'll go to source code. I'm not sure what's happening there. And we'll open the project and solution again. Yeah, for whatever reason, it's decided not to work. OK, I'm not sure what that problem is. But uh, it was working before, so I apologize. But basically, what would happen, just to show you here, is that um, when I created this, uh, the, the, when I started debugging, it would actually bring up the Chrome browser, and the Chrome browser would create a uh, instance of these, this application within within Android, and I could actually see how this works. So maybe we'll try it a little bit later and see what happens. So in the meantime, what we'll do is I'll show you a different way of actually doing this. Now there's one more demo that I'm going to show, and that's actually bringing over an existing website and adding it into a Cordova application. So I'm just going to start Visual Studio again. And hopefully, it'll work this time from a debugging standpoint, because I'd be very unfortunate if it didn't. Wait for this to show up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, include an existing application or game called Yeti Bowl. So you can actually get Yeti Bowl yourself. So if I actually do a search for uh, Yeti Bowl, it's actually on Codeplex, Yeti Bowl the game. And you can download the source code. And basically what this is, it's basically a, a reference application or a reference game for HTML5 uh, for, for the web. So it's a web application as well as a Windows 8 WinJS application as well as we created a native version of Windows Phone 8 as well if you wanted to. Uh, but the intent there is that we're going to focus specifically on the web application uh, to create this. So hopefully this will uh, work properly and we'll show you what it looks like. So here I am. I'm going to go to File New Project again. And we'll create a blank Cordova app again in JavaScript, so that's fine. So once it's created, just wait for this to show up. All right, wait for it to load up. Okay, so we have all this information. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I've already downloaded the, the, uh, the Yeti Bowl uh, uh, code. So I'm just going to double click on this and I'm going to highlight and copy it all over. So if I go to my code folder, which is where I actually created that application, or demos, I think it is, and it's uh, Cordova App 3. And if I click on this, I control V. So there, I've added these things into the folder where my project is. Now what I need to do is that doesn't automatically mean that the, copy, the folders that I copied over and the code that I copied over gets re uh, referenced within my application. What I need to do here is I need to show all files. So basically what this will do is it'll find all the files that are within the folder structure that was created for my solution. So you see here, there's a number of different things that may or may not show up very well, but basically, you know, there's a bin and the build folder. We'll ignore those. We don't need to add those. We will add the game library. So we're going to say um, include in the project. And we'll add JavaScript in the media. So I'm just going to shift click, include in the project. Okay. And we'll include game.html, including the project. Now, one last thing that we're going to do, because the, the default uh, page that's all uh, set up for the, um, the Cordova application is index.html. So I'm going to rename this one to index1, just for the heck of it. And we'll rename game.html to to index.html. Now, we're going to try to this, uh, the Ripple side of thing again, and hopefully this will work. So let's see. Yeah, and it's decided not to, to work. Well, that's really unfortunate. So basically what would have happened is this would have actually shown up and actually uh, provided you with um, uh, the, it, it would have actually uh, created the, um, uh, the, the debugger process and showed you the game. So in fact, what I, I think I'll do is I got another virtual machine. Maybe there's a problem with the virtual machine or something. And if I click exit here, let's see if we can actually get to a different virtual machine. So we'll go to my original one here, and I'll connect to it. 
So I'm just RDPing in, so remote desktoping into my virtual machine in the cloud. And we'll try that again. So this should show up soon. OK, that's fine. This shows up. Click OK. All right. OK, so all right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Visual Studio 2013. In this case, I'm running premium. It doesn't really matter. And I'm going to go to File, New. Help if I could actually do it properly. Project. And here you see, for example, blank application, the Cordova. So we're just going to click OK on this. OK. So once it's already loaded up here, as you can see, all this stuff is here. Now I'm going to actually go get the uh, the content, so I'm going to go to the desktop because I've got this on this one as well, and get the Yeti Bowl web content. Copy and paste it over to my code. And this is Cordova 3. Okay, and we'll just copy and paste it over. There we go. Now we'll go through and do the same thing that we did before. So we're going to show all files. And we'll include the game library, the JavaScript and the media, include game.html, include it. Now we'll rename this one. index1, and we'll name this to index. And we'll try this again. So we'll save all this just to make sure we're good. And we'll go to the ripple. And now it seems to be working properly. So, so I'll be able to show you a little bit about uh, what this looks like as well from the uh, uh, from, from the Ripple, uh, Ripple debugger as well, or the Ripple emulator. So it's just going to bring, bring up Cor uh, Chrome. Okay, so we'll just wait for this to load up. As you can see, it's creating a local version of it uh, in port 4400, which if you can see that on your screen. And there you go, there's a the game. And there's some uh, hikers that are trying to go up the hike, and there's my Yeti who's just basically going to throw down balls and see if I can hit any of these things. So the interesting thing about this is um, you know the screen refresh level is a little bit low, so I apologize for that. But um, well, you see, I've, I'm not a very good player at this. But uh, you can see there's there, there's what it looks like. Now, what I can do is I can actually do the orientation. So there's a whole bunch of different things that are available to me to, to actually take a look. So you can see there, that's what it looks like if it's uh, screen orientation is uh, in portrait rather than landscape. Provides some platforms, so you can actually see the various different platforms that are supported. In this case, Apache Cordoba phone gap can change the version of it if I want to. Plus, it also provides me with a whole bunch of different things. So like, what, what would happen if I'm simulating Ethernet versus something else, for example? You can give some globalization. So you know, what's the locale? So if I wanted to do, for example, French, I could do that as well. And, and, all, and you can even fake out uh, GPS capabilities here as well. So with me just bringing, copying over an existing website, it was actually quite easy for me to create a, a Cordova application and make use of that, for example. There's other things such as settings here that you can see as well. Uh, and that's, uh, for example, you, know, you can have some proxies and things like that, as well as uh, pr provide the theme. So if you wanted to use light theme versus dark theme and things like that of your d device and things like that to see how it works and how it looks on your application using those themes, you can do that. So that's all well and good. Um, but that's an example of you know, how you can actually create um, uh, a game, for example. And, and I didn't go through the code of the, the game because you can actually go through that yourself uh, and take a look at it. It's really more the, the intent behind that demo is to show you how you can actually bring existing assets and bring them over to a Cordova application. And I could actually bring this to Windows Phone or Windows and all those types of things as well. 
Now, the other thing I want to show you is I'm going to exit this, and I'm going to redo that in initial uh, Hello World application. And I'll close the solution, and I'll create a new, new application just to show that to you so you can see it. So I go to File, New Project. Okay. And in this case, what we'll do here is we'll create uh, another, uh, a, another blank Cordova application. And in this case, what I'll do, again, is I'm going to add an image. So we're going to provide that exploding dinosaur image. Uh, we'll add an existing item, which I have on my desktop, I believe. So let's just see here. There you are. So there's my... Uh, my thing there, and now I'll go to the index.html and we'll redo this just to show you. So, for example, here, you know, uh, in this case, we'll rename this to uh, exploding dinosaurs with the exclamation mark, and then again here we'll put this as uh, exploding dinosaurs. And then we'll add the image. Oop. Image source equals, and then we'll say images, and then de, which is whoop, images slash de.jpg. Okay. And maybe we'll just add another paragraph and we'll just say, JR, we miss you. See you next episode. Okay, so we, uh, we got that done and now we'll save this. And now we'll actually bring this up in Ripple again just to show you what it looks like. And if we take a look at this, it's actually bringing it up. And there you go. So you have exploding dinosaurs. JR, we miss you. See you next episode. And the requisite dinosaur with explosions going on at the same time. So you can do your debugging. Uh, and like you would normally do with, uh, uh, with uh, debugging within Visual Studio for ASP.NET MVC, for example, you could do the same as well for, uh, uh, for your applications uh, within Cordova as well. You can even do, like I said, let's see what it looks like uh, when we're actually in um, in that format. So you can also see, for example, all sorts of things like that. So, so that's all well and good, and that's, that's great to see. So um, the, the, the great thing about this is that it's, it's, a fully capable, full, it's a full capability within Visual Studio, currently in CTP, uh, Community Technology Preview, which means that you know, it's not currently in production, but you do have a go-live license with it uh, to actually build applications for uh, Cordova using this. And it's actually really easy to deliver great experiences uh, regardless of whether it's an existing website that you're actually trying to port into a mobile application or, you know, just creating new applications all, all, all alone, uh, all the same for yourself. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to leave that as is and uh, I'll let you uh, uh, play with the tooling yourself. If you do have an MSDN subscription for, uh, for, for your, that's uh, named to you, I do uh, encourage you to try just creating a virtual machine uh, and doing this in the virtual machine because it's a, a great way to do th and test out these things. And test out uh, the next version of Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio 2015, uh, which is also available as a virtual machine uh, for MSDN subscribers uh, to test out uh, because the Cordova capabilities will be built in automatically into that and you can, uh, you can go to town with it. So with that, um, I'll leave, uh, leave you be for now. I do want to say happy holidays to everybody, uh, seeing that it's December. So uh, anybody that's taking vacation, enjoy it. If you're not taking vacation, make sure you take some time off for yourself. Uh, I know I will be. And uh, we'll see you in the new year in 2015 with more exciting uh, stuff from Breakpoint. So take care and uh, have a great one. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Breakpoint. Just wanted to remind you, you're, you're going to do that to me right in the middle. I'm doing my spiel. Sorry. OK. Anyway, as I was saying, just to remind you, if you scroll a little bit further down, there's a quick form that you can fill out. 
this is what I have to deal with. Anyway, there's a quick form for you to fill out that actually allows us to get in touch with you um, if you wanted to become the Visual Studio champion of your company. So it's really cool. Make sure you to fill it out. We'll get in touch with you. We'll give you all the information that you need. Um, and then we can see what Visual Studio can do for you and your company. Very cool. Yeah. Talk to you soon.